Welcome to another program of Health Matters. On our program this week, uh, we have got uh, Dr. Tracy Bavel. She is the head of uh, the Infectious Disease Hospital uh, at Lillendal, commonly known as the COVID-19 Hospital. Welcome to our program. Glad that you can be with us. Now, we've got you you know, recent news of uh, lifting of some restrictions uh, at, you know, in the country as it relates to COVID. Uh, will that make your work easier, you think? So my work ultimately starts at the infectious disease hospital when the patients come in. So what is decreasing our workload is our patient load. So at the moment, we have a decrease in the amount of patients that we have. So yes, our workload has decreased. Um, in relation to the measures in the hospital of itself, because we're still dealing with an infectious disease, we are still wearing our appropriate PPEs, meaning our masks, our gowns, our gloves. We're still wearing all of our PPEs at the hospital. There have been so much stories uh, in the press from um, survivors, from relatives of survivors, relatives of persons who would have passed away. And people out there um, have got their own, their own picture of what is happening there. Well, walk us through. So at the Ocean View facility, commonly known as the Ocean View facility, but the Infectious Disease Hospital. At the Infectious Disease Hospital, we see patients that are COVID-19 positive, we see patients that are potentially COVID-19 positive. We call that the transition period. And we also see persons that have COVID-19, but would have other ailments as well. Not ailments necessarily associated with COVID-19. They may have chronic diseases or they might have been involved in a multi-vehicle accident, or they may have been in some kind of trauma as well. And polytrauma patients, we have patients with complications from diabetes, complications from hypertension, patients with cancer, patients with varying illnesses that, as we might say, it is an incidental finding that they're COVID-19 positive because we did the tests and they are COVID-19 positive. We also have patients at the Ocean View facility that in the interim, while they're waiting on their results, there is need for them to get health care and medical care and be managed medically. So we have an area designated for persons like those that are waiting for their COVID-19 results. And, when, and within the few hours that they're waiting on their results, they're observed there, they're treated there in that particular area, separate from COVID-19 positive patients. And if their result is negative, then they are returned to either the Georgetown Public Hospital or where their family may prefer for them to continue their health care. At the Ocean View facility, um, we are able to treat patients for varying illnesses, as I explained. We have a surgical area. We have an operating theater. That was open last year, in November last year. And in our operating theater, we're now capable of offering persons the surgical interventions that they need, even though you're COVID-19 positive. Now, this makes a huge difference because with you being able to offer surgery for even though you have an infectious disease, that limits the exposure to other patients that limits the exposure to staff of itself. And that means that even though you have an infectious disease, you can still have surgical intervention because we have found that, yes, you might be COVID-19 positive, but COVID-19 positive persons still do have emergencies, still do need surgical in interventions, still do need surgeries. Look at our mothers or pregnant mothers. So they might be COVID-19 positive, but they still need to deliver their babies. They might need to have a cesarean section to deliver that baby. And with us having the operating theater open, that possibility is always there. What would 
how do you treat patients, especially when they would have heard of this, you know, lots of this stigma uh, and these stories, and you find a patient going in there um, uh, that might be stressed out or, you know, may have mental health issues? Do you look after that overall well-being of those patients also? So the approach to a COVID-19 patient or any infectious disease related patient is a multidisciplinary approach. And that means simply that multiple disciplines are treating this patient. So for COVID-19, it's more of a internal medicine situation. You might have pneumonia, you might have a complication. So that is for internal medicine. However, you have the psychological factor. Yes. And that's where you have the psychologist intervening. You also have nursing. Nursing would help with dressings, uh, administer medications, administer your um, assistance to the bathroom, assistance in procedures and things like that. You also have our attendants that you'd say attendants or porters. Now, they are not necessarily medical, but without them, how do we raise the patient? How do you move the patient from point A to dialysis, for example, to go down for dialysis? How do you carry them to theater? How do you ensure that they have their um, CT, carry them to CT? You have your physiotherapist. Our physiotherapists come and they do not only chest physiotherapy, as in checking, ensuring that they are giving physiotherapy to the chest, where most persons think COVID-19 is concentrated on because of pneumonia. They also do extremity physiotherapy. They do group exercises. They also do occupational therapy. We also have patients in the hospital that due to their complications of their chronic illnesses, they have speech imp um, impediments. Mm -hmm. And so we also have speech therapy going on with that. So that's for physiotherapy. We also have cleaning happening. We have our cleaners, designated cleaners. Uh, for example, in the ICU every four hours, the ICU is cleaned. And so when I say multidisciplinary approach, you're not looking at just, hey, you're sick, you have to get medicine. It is ensuring that you're getting the meals that you need. It's not just giving you food. It's now, okay, so this patient is diabetic and hypertensive. This patient is only hypertensive. This patient has a particular cancer. So their diet, even though it is food... So it's not a one-size-fits-all. No, it isn't. It isn't a one-size-fits-all at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you would have different managements and different disciplines approaching each patient. Now, so I'm back in the patient's you know, needs... Um, a psychiatrist or a psychologist, is that also available? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So our psychologist is always available. Mm -hmm. And if we have a psychiatric patient, a patient that we have psychiatric concerns about, we simply call the psychiatry department over at the Georgetown Public Hospital, which it's a, it's a good relationship. It's a brother-sister relationship or a uncle niece relationship and you call over and they would come over and review the patient mm -hmm. so any review any special specialty that is available at the georgian public hospital is available at the infectious disease hospital we have our surgeons coming and intervening on patients now you're thinking okay COVID 19 you're thinking it's more of a medical problem but as i said before we have many complications, not just necessarily from COVID-19. You have patients, for example, that might have an appendix that has to be taken out or has to be removed. A surgeon has to come and review that patient. A patient would be having a broken limb. The orthopedic surgeon has to come and review that patient. The cardiologist will have to come to see the patients that might have had heart attacks. So those are, those are, when we say multidisciplinary approach, it is according to the needs of that particular patient. Obviously, when you're at your peak, 
um, there's going to be the need for um, all hands aboard. And no doubt, you know, what we would have heard, three frontline workers must have been in cases where they've been tested and tried. How yourself and your colleagues, how do you manage all of this, especially when you're at a peak load? So when we're at a peak, I honestly feel that that's when we shine. Now, the, the interesting thing is that we speak of when we're having a peak, but we speak of a team even before a peak. And because of the relationships that we have, these, we have developed as a team, we understand that we need to check in on each other. Because even without a peak, we realize that dealing with an infectious disease, or let's say in 2020, for example, when we started off, we didn't know a lot about COVID-19. So there was a lot of unknown things about it. And so you understood that the only way to support each other is to brace on each other. If you're having a tough day, I have to check in on you. I have to be able to pick up that you're having a tough day. And let me see how I can take off the load from you a little. So if you have an increase in your patient load and I have a decrease in mine, I now step over and help you. Or I notice that, you know, one of your patients is having a tough time and it's affecting you because we are seeing these people every single day. We are seeing our patients every single day. And when you see someone every single day, you develop a relationship with them. You get to know them. You get to know, okay, you do not like pepper on your food. You do not like your blanket. You don't like the white blanket. You like the green blanket. You get to know that, okay, I have to coerce you to take this medication. I have to persuade you. I have to um, uh, remind you that you have to do this. I have to take you to the bathroom because you are not the person that could actually go and bathe by yourself. You get to know them and you also get to know their families because on a daily basis, you're speaking to the relatives. And so some or the other, you develop a very close relationship with a lot of your patients and your relatives. And in doing that, what happens is that when they are having bad outcomes due to their illness, it also sometimes can affect you as the healthcare worker. So as a team player and as a team member, I have to pick up, hey, you're having a tough one. You're having a tough day. Let us see how we can do this okay. and After support each other. We'll take a break and when we come back, we'll have more on our program. This is Health Matters. Leaving the hospital was a big victory for me. My name is Indira Lepuku. I'm a mother of two, ages nine and six. In September of last year, a close relative of mine got COVID and that relative of mine, very close family member, she went on to get pneumonia with COVID and she was to the point of death. After that, we realized that we were all exposed after it was confirmed that she had COVID and we decided to go get tested. As soon as we got tested, we were all tested and we were all tested positive. The first week went by, the ministry official was calling every day. They were checking up and then the second week passed and I started to get back more symptoms. After I told the nurse, uh, she said, you know, I think you need to go get tested again. I went and I got retested and I was still positive. I was saying, okay, fine, this is another two weeks. I'm gonna be fine, I'm gonna go through it and I'll be okay. And one day I was lying down, it was about six o'clock in the evening and I jumped up out of my sleep because I couldn't breathe properly. The shortness of breath continued, but it only happened when I was lying down. So I'd have to wake up in the middle of the night and sit up trying to breathe properly. It had kept happening every time and it started to increase. Um, so I went back to the same GPHC COVID section and another doctor looked at me and he didn't want to take any chances. 
So, he told me I'm gonna send you to Liliandal. I had to tell my children, I'm not gonna be there for a little while. As I was in there, you know, being in hospital, it's taxing mentally. It's very easy to fall into depression. Psychologically, you can't do it on your own. By all means, you need all the support that you can get from family and friends. I was able to get people like my past and so on calling and checking on me. And it helped, but I still wasn't able to see my children. So my husband decided that before they, they have online school, so in the mornings before he goes to work, at five, he would bring them up. We live all the way in Diamond. So he would come all the way up on the East Coast um, and take them over the road where my where my room was there was a glass door and when I look through the glass door I see the sea walls the back of the sea walls so he would go there and he would take them and they would wave to me and I can tell you that was very heartbreaking of course when you're talking to them you can't let them know how you feel because you don't want them to know that this is as scary as you feel you don't want that to, to translate to them um, that helped me though seeing them every morning helped me being in there uh, is not what we need to do we need to try our best to stay out of a hospital leaving the hospital was a big victory for me but as I went home I spent three months sitting up sleeping because I couldn't breathe properly when I lie down. After COVID, your life is never the same. My body wasn't the same. I had symptoms of long COVID where I had a cloudy, everything was cloudy for me. Um, my body couldn't, I couldn't go up a flight of stairs without, without panting for breath. And it was frustrating because I was getting nowhere. I was trying everything. And, um, one doctor at the respiratory clinic at GPHC decided to say, I'm going to send you to physiotherapy. I had a really good therapist. She was able to give me some exercises and she moved me from, I think we had six weeks of physiotherapy. And I can tell you from that, I'm now able to lie down flat and sleep like a normal person again. It has taken some time. We're getting a little bit lackadaisical in our approach to COVID, where we don't want to wear masks, we don't want to do this, we're, we're tired of sanitizing, but it's necessary. And more importantly, it's necessary for us to vaccinate. I can tell you, even though I had COVID, I wasn't afraid to take the vaccine. But I knew that this is the only way that I can protect not only myself, but my family. It's important that I, I stay protecting my family, my loved ones, the people that are around me at work, at home, um, the people that I come into contact with. I've heard some people say that this is not going to touch this kind of person. It, it can't touch me because I'm strong. I can deal with it. It has nothing to do with that. It may not touch you the way you're hearing it touched me. Your body might be able to handle it, but when you take it home, what happens? Somebody that's weaker. So vaccinate, it's our safe way of getting out of this. And it's a safe way of getting the world back to normal. Welcome back to our program. We are still with Dr. Tracy Bavel, head of uh, the Infectious Disease Hospital there at Lillendale. Uh, doctor, of course, you know, hospitals are supposed to, you know, bring people back into good, healthy well-being. But uh, as you said, it's uh, at the beginning of COVID two years ago, we didn't know. And so people fell off. Uh, uh, that heartbeat um, and people passed away, people died. And we've seen that number every day on that dashboard of the increase in numbers. Some, you know, you had a spike and then there was a plateau and then it came down and so forth. We've all, again, heard so many stories, but you there saw it for yourself. 
those who didn't survive, what was the story behind that? Why some of those people didn't survive? So there are many reasons why persons have died. But the majority of the persons that might have that would have died, those persons were very critically ill from the inception. As in, as soon as they came in, they were in so much having so much shortness of breath that they required different equipment. So normally, when a patient starts off with shortness of breath, you provide supplemental oxygen. You provide supplemental oxygen by giving them a regular face mask, not this type, an oxygen mask. When that is not working because you have increased the amount of oxygen to the maximum that you can give through that mask, we have a different type of mask that's called a CPAP mask. Now, a CPAP mask is something that is fitting snugly on your face and helping push oxygen into your lungs. When that is no longer working, we have to do something called intubation and put you on a ventilator, which in common terms, people say put you on a life support machine. And intubation is basically putting a tube down into your lungs to breed for you. We also have patients that even though they are COVID-19 positive, we have quite a lot of patients that are coming in with complications from their own illness. So for example, cardiac patients, as in heart patients, that their heart was not squeezing. So everyone's heart starts off squeezing at 100%. So if I say that your heart is squeezing at 5%, you understand that it's not squeezing at all. And if your heart is not functioning in the way that it's supposed to function, then it's it's not doing the job that it's supposed to do. So whether you have COVID or you do not have COVID, there's a high possibility that you can die from that complication. Mm -hmm. So there are other illnesses that even before COVID-19, persons were dying from. And that, unfortunately, has not changed. While you work to change those things, there's still some complications from illnesses like, for example, we said heart attacks. We said your heart not squeezing properly. Complications from your diabetes. Um, complications from a surgery that you had to have because of late intervention, because of the timing that you arrived at a hospital as well. These are things that have caused deaths along the years, even before COVID-19. And so now with us finding the incidental finding of having COVID-19, persons feel that once you have, once you're COVID-19 positive, that is the cause of your death. And some of the cases, a lot of the cases, that is not so. So you, depending, I, I don't really want to get into patients' personal information, but a lot of the complications are not necessarily, are more the cause of death than COVID-19. Again, around the world, we saw uh, mostly the elderly uh, yes. persons um, would have died, and especially, uh, you know, we're glued to American television and we saw the, the elderly homes and, 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 and these mature people, they came on the, that um, category of those who died most. But yet, um, we saw in Guyana some cases of young people. And, you know, young people went around saying, you know, I can't get COVID. I've got my immune system intact and I'm young. And of course, the whole the adage is young people don't die. We still saw young people. How come young people? So once again, mm -hmm. we have persons of varying age groups that have illnesses. Mm -hmm. Some of them that they are aware of before and they're not taking care of them. And they are other, others that are newly diagnosed at the time of admission, not necessarily at the time of admission to the infectious disease hospital, but at the time of being admitted to a health facility. Uh, the other thing that we noticed is that the majority of our patients that were dying were also not vaccinated. So that and that is still happening. The majority of the patients are also still not vaccinated. Now, you will have a few that even after being vaccinated, they would have died. And then you have to look at the fact that they had other complications from their other illnesses. Mm -hmm. We have young persons that would have hypertension, diabetes, cancer. Um, we have persons with complications from 
uh, rare illnesses that they did not, they weren't aware of at initially uh, until very late. Of course, you would have had other um, immune suppressant um, illnesses also yes. coming into yes. play. Um, what, when somebody walks out of that hospital, what a sense, what do you sense is going through them? I'm alive. Huh? I'm well. I am happy to be with my family. This mm -hmm. is what I'm thinking. And, and, because, huh? and no family can go and visit. Yes. I'm happy to be with my family. Yeah. I'm happy to see my child. I'm happy to see my wife. I'm happy to see my husband. Um, I'm alive and well. I had COVID and I no longer have COVID. Or it is that um, I have COVID. I had COVID. I still have COVID, but at least I can, I'm now not needing oxygen. Or when we have patients that, for example, those that we had to put on what we call the, what lay persons would call the life support machine, the mm -hmm. ventilator. I know that they are happy. I know they're very happy. They're excited. It's, it's, it's really, really hard to rendering to watch a patient so excited to come out of being on a ventilator. You no need to be. You no longer need that life support machine that makes that sound. As much as we know it's helping you, we also know that it's pretty uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's not normal. You're not accustomed to being there, having a tube down your mouth. So we try to make you as comfortable as possible to sedate you and ensure that you're paralyzed at that time, so that you're not going through that throughout that entire process but to come off of that machine and now be able to breathe on regular oxygen mask that progress that when that patient sees themselves make that progress they are excited i remember at christmas time we had a particular patient that she was taken off of the ventilator she was then placed on the cpap tight mask she was taken off of that and then she was placed on oxygen mask and she she heard some music outside and she wants to go outside and dance and <laughs> when we opened the door and she went outside on her wheelchair with her portable oxygen and she decided to dance she felt good and that makes us feel good as well because we want to see our patients have good outcomes and that's why we put in all of the efforts as in Guyana has first world medications we're having all the we have the the remdesivir we have baricitinib we have dexamethasone we have any antibiotics the appropriate antibiotics that are needed for illnesses that are complications as well whatever we need we ask for and we're getting it we have our vaccines in the country we have the things to actually support us so so, just this week, there's been lifting of certain restrictions. That doesn't mean COVID has just disappeared like that. And you have your work to be done. Should we, as a people, viewers, take down our masks, let our guards down? Should we really go back to normal? Or should we go back to normal, but with some sort of understanding that we should protect ourselves and others? So while we are trying to go back to normal, we have to also understand that we've had two years of experience of learning how to protect ourselves. And one of the things, well, not one, but a couple of the things that we have definitely learned is that you need to wash your hands, you need to sanitize, you need to wear your face mask and not, and I always say this, not just wear it, but wear it properly. I'm ensuring it's always covering your nose, your mouth and your chin. Wash your hands, sanitize your hands, do that extra effort because yes, um, we have less cases in country and we're very happy for that. We would like to have zero cases at some point in time, but at the moment, COVID is still happening around the world and in Guyana. So you still have to be smart about it and just try to ensure that you protect yourself. Has this been tough on you? Um. I'm not sure where, where are you coming from. I, I just want to know that, it, you, you know, we, this can all go away, but it can still come back. Would you still go back and do it again? Yes. Let me tell you why. Um, 
I I don't have any regrets in relation to dealing with COVID-19 and dealing with COVID-19 patients because I signed up for medicine. I signed up to save lives. I signed up to ensure I do my utmost best. But did you believe in your wildest dream when you were studying and boring? And no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nobody. I remembered mm -hmm. in, in January 2020 that I heard in China there was something happening. I'm like, hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. So as a mass casualty person, we had discussions with our DMPS. And we said, okay, we'll prepare. We'll be fully prepared. But this most likely would not be happening. It would not reach our, our borders. We were we were ready. We said, okay, we'll designate an ICU for it at Georgetown Hospital and everything. When our first case happened, we were like, it happened? <laughs> we were all shocked. But um, at least the difference is when you are, you have the heads up, you're able to prepare. You will still find things that you can do better. And looking back, you can always, in retrospect, you can think of doing something a little different, a little, you know, a little ahead of time. But at the end, it, you know, we have no... I would do it again. Thank you for being with us and sharing uh, your work at uh, the Infectious Disease Hospital there at Lillianal and some personal insights as to your work. I'm Nazim Hussein. Do join us again next time for another edition of Health Matters. And until that time, be safe.